I'm just checking the schedule. Uh, John's going to kick us off for the final series of um, 10 minute presentations talking about the inquiry based learning uh, with an open bench. Is that right, John? Well, yeah, we've got, have we got the, got the slides? Uh, okay, I'll go to the desktop. Which one? Just check. There you go to screen share. Um, yeah, I wanted to sort of just take a, a little uh, rise above to sort of get a bit of a map view of EBL in a way um, and uh, locate it in three locations. Um, one is. Um, I haven't had a lot to do with uh, EBL in the Faculty of Health Sciences recently until its origins in 2009 when the people from Manchester, from Siebel Centre for Excellence for EBL came out here and, and started some stuff. That's one point. And then in uh, the Faculty of uh, Business, Economics and Law, we had um, Philip Levy visit the university and bring some influences from the University of Sheffield, so CLAS, CLL. AFS. And um, so there's another kind of perspective there. And the third one is on my study leave last year by accident I came across a university in Denmark and spent some time there which was total EBL, EBL, total focus. All the curriculum, the whole university was around that. And that really gave me a kind of um, comparison. But even if you just read the literature you can see that EBL or PBL or IBL um, oh, it's going to go. Okay. Um, well, I want to look at to what extent it's radical and turns things upside down. That's it. Yep. Um, how multiple it is, even just PBL itself, is quite multiple right from its origins. So I want to have a little look at revisit EBL, how it occurs differently, um, and uh, also look at um, what the participants are, how we think about the who's involved in it and the things involved in it. Um, look at it beyond just a learning activity. How can it be sort of opened out? Or what does that mean? Uh, it's not just physical, it's also virtual. How can that happen? Um, and some, some maybe questions for thinking around that. And uh, I swapped order of presentation with Ruth because I realise she's actually doing some of the things I'm alluding to here. So I think she's a sort of perfect follow-on from some issues you might find uh, relevant that come up from it. So, um, oh, let's move on. Oh yeah, so in a sense what EBL is doing is, is shifting from a mode of learning that's traditionally been closed one-to-one -to -one teach a student affair to opening it out at least to, to peer learning in some way and perhaps beyond. Um, and that was the thinking that's driven a lot of it originally. So so its origins well with PBL are with um, people like Howard Barrows in McMaster's University and right from the start then it, it developed into quite a lot of different versions or different ways of doing things. Uh, a conglomerate of interventions was written about at the time. Um, and as you know it has its origins in more constructivist ideas of learning so it's very much based around experience um, rather than transmission of content. So we have distinct models coming up. Um, problem based and so on, problem case project based and um, one definition, it's very hard to find defi definitions here but the um, University of Sheffield Centre where Philip Levy comes from gives it a definition of a cluster of student centred approaches driven by inquiry and research and they in particular link the two whereas inquiries can be thought of in many ways 
they link research with it, which is particularly interesting given our <laughs> graduate capabilities, how they do that. Um, and EBL has, has been called by the people from Manchester an umbrella term for a range, range of approaches like PBL and case learning, and project learning. And some would say that's a little bit um, presumptuous as sort of the EBL is the last entrance in the room and it's claiming this overarching status of the whole thing. Um, and quite a few people probably wouldn't agree with that. So the way Philip Levy talks about it is distinguishes PBL as sort of the first historically way it was articulated in medical schools as a very close, specific problem, quite convergent. Here's a, here's a real world problem. We've got to solve whether someone will die. How do you do it? You know, and they, they tackled it that way. Um, whereas um, the EBL or IBL approach is more open-ended. Complexity means there's more than one solution. It's a process of, of doing the work, um, working through the inquiry, coming up with a fit-for-purpose solution. So it's a more divergent inquiry and it suits a number of disciplines in that sense. Um, but there's a, a fair bit of it around the world and so there's a fair bit of evidence which will make um, claims to, well, our graduates are now work ready, uh, they're engaged with things as global citizenships and um, they can engage with complexity and they're actually dealing with real world problems rather than just preparing for them. Um, and so I think uh, it's been around long enough to be a fair body of evidence. And I did notice the Wikipedia entry for inquiry-based learning gives a huge slab to one of those big sort of um, meta view, meta literature review things saying there is no evidence that EBL does it makes any difference to learning um, whatsoever. Which um, I think, well, what do they mean by EBL? Is it just one thing? What are they measuring here? I think it's a fairly um, um, arrogant sort of statement to make, given that you can't really call the kinds of EBL all one thing, and therefore gather stats about them. Okay, so um, so some of the things I want to, uh, if we're looking at, say, the literature from the University of Sheffield, Seabill, and also from uh, various other places, the one of the ways EBL can be open, can open out, is is to complex real problems, and uh, linking it to research. And part of the way people like places like in Denmark and other places do that is to bring in outsiders to get that learning happening outside the classroom, outside the university. Um, doing things like bringing in, getting people involved in professions, coming into presentations, you know, mixing it up a bit. So making the, the boundaries of the institution more porous in that sense. Um, so in that sense it's quite a long term project to set that up in a curriculum. So just um, thinking about the particular ingredients, it's uh, the principles, uh, real world inquiries, going across discipline boundaries, and experience being central and being a social and collaborative kind of thing, uh, to, to make that happen, in reality, you need different participants. You know, so obviously, you need the students, you need spaces for learning. In, these come in all kinds of forms. Informal spaces, in particular, are important for EBL. I think um, that one's at. I think we're trying. Artifacts uh, are critical here, shared artifacts that go between people and persist over time. Uh, it can be butcher's paper or it can be online. 
and of course opportunities to organise. Um, so in a place like Denmark, of course, uh, yeah. students don't have to pay fees, they don't have to work, and there's enough shared spaces around for them to um, book and you know do EBL informally. Um, but there's alternatives. There's also virtual spaces here. So I'll just put this uh, map, I guess, is, is used in FL to uh, look at one of the large core uh, business foundation units. Um, the problem is central again, and the lectures, which are usually central, become town hall meetings with the seminars, and they become resources. Their speakers, that kind of stuff. So it's a different uh, kind of panopticon of learning. Um, and it's interesting that I've found one of the things in Denmark I said, well, how do you do your peer assessments? You know? How does that work? And they looked at me and said, what? We don't do peer assessment. Um, it just didn't ever occur to them. So it's not an essential coupling with EBL. There's good reasons to do it, yeah. Um, but they don't have the, the mass pressures there to make that such a driver. What they have is huge group assignments and then um, students are, have a beta where they have to defend their role in the group assignment. So you can imagine sort of doing a, a beta exam with all your uh, 310 students. It would take quite a time. Um, And the other, the sense that I get elsewhere is EBL drives the, the whole course or program in a stage way. So in the early stages it might be a lot more uh, teacher control um, and only in, in various stages is it sort of become more um, independent learning. And um, I think a lot of places also do a hybrid model where students do some subjects that are traditional at the same time as some subjects that are EBL. So they actually work between the two and the whole course curriculum is structured so that works together. So some questions I've got, I guess, are um, how should uh, at La Trobe, I wonder if EBL, it happens in two and humanities, two and a half faculties, say, on three faculties it occurs. Um, I wonder if there's any connection between them. I don't know that there's much. I wonder if they should. Um, and um, I wonder also is, if opening can connect more to outside the university, to practitioners, to discipline knowledge um, and professionals out in the world. And how can it happen over, how do we support EBL over physical spaces? I think we're doing some very good things here, but over virtual spaces, it's really make it up as you go along. Um, and I think um, if we think we've got the the LMS, we've got Moodle, ePortfolio, it can happen there, it's supported. But students do their own stuff, especially with social media. So I wonder if we should take a role in getting involved in student-initiated social media, how they work together, how they share files, um, you know, how they set up their own Moodle groups or Facebook groups, that kind of stuff. I'm not saying we should be in there, but we need to bring their activity for their independent learning just as they go and have informal their own groups face-to-face -face in a cafe or something. We need to sort of bring that into the scheme of things and maybe um, give them some, some guidance about how to use this stuff, um, rather than pretend it's somewhere else. So, that's about it. Well, thank you, John. Well done for the 10 minutes.